Uh, that was at the airport hotel <laughs> the night before I got on the flight to this place in, in Santa Fe. I mean, everything was shutting down. I could, there was just my whole body ached. Uh, yeah, I was going blind. I couldn't, I was, I was having hallucinations. I was having major hallucinations. I saw the depths, swirling depths of hell in my front steps of my house. I was looking down going, what the fuck? There's all my sins, all everything I hated about myself was swirling down into the darkness. I swear I saw that. We're here with Sam Pond, and um, I think some of you know Sam from a previous video where I interviewed Sam about uh, his growth. He is now a fearless coach. He um, he started out as a student, uh, changed his whole life. Definitely watch that video. Uh, look for a link in the description. There should be one. Uh, but you know, it's funny. The video was titled Dating for Men Over 40, but we ended up talking about a shitload of other stuff that was not about dating people, over 40. People love that video, dude. Yeah. They, they, they went nuts over it. And people, like you said, people see you now and they get a little starstruck. You know, like, <laughs> There's right. that Sam guy, right? And Sam's over 60, right? 63 killing it and uh and we were just having so this is kind of a podcast we're gonna have a discussion here this is not gonna be any strict topic but so uh sam was just at i'll let sam ask because he asked me an interesting question we started to talk and then uh cosman who's behind the camera over here said no we got to get this on footage so we're gonna we're gonna record it right now um, yeah the question was what was your bottom and the, it's a bottom is the word is used in like addiction and alcohol uh you know in aa like what was your bottoms for some people it was find themselves in the bottom of the shower with a bottle of vodka and water pouring over them. And often I've noticed with guys who start whatever work they really need to start, there was one thing. What was the one thing that tri that tripped that uh, trigger that said now? And it's interesting you brought this up today because earlier today we filmed three videos for the channel and the subject of the three videos was pain, the pain that caused me to stop fucking around and move and start taking my life seriously because up until that point i had thought oh something's going to show up i'll read enough books i'll, I'll see is the right thing the, you know some, something's something from the outside is going to change me. Yeah, yeah and that's exactly what i was waiting for that thing from the outside <laughs> yeah. and then i hit this point and i left out a part in those videos so if you guys saw those videos you're going to hear the part i left out and i realized i left it out just now when sam asked me this question and i talked about it. i was living in that yoga community and that guy daniel moved in and i thought i'm going to get all these yoga chicks and it's going to be amazing and I didn't get any. They all wanted to fix me because I felt so broken inside. They could feel how broken I probably felt good to have them try to fix you a little bit too. Yeah. No, actually it used no. to feel good. And it so never worked in my life because that would happen to me a lot that yeah. I was almost becoming resentful of it. Nice. I was pissed. And I remember <laughs> they had system relationships, they called them. This is crazy. They had these system relationships. The guru, the teacher would say, you two are now a couple and, you, and you're supposed to just go. Whether you liked each other or not, it didn't matter, right? And I hadn't taken hand, they call it, where you take the teacher as your teacher. I hadn't done that yet. But I, I realized they, there was this one girl I liked. Um, she was one of the, the yoginis there, this really hot one. And I thought she's so cute. And I was like uh, pining over her. And they all knew, they could all see it. And then finally the one day they go, Brian, she's gonna be your roommate. And I'm like, what? 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 And then she started running around naked in front of me. And I'm like, very yogi, right? Like hippie yogi. Like I'm trying to get somewhere with her, but I realized I was terrible. My game was terrible. And there's no reason this girl should like me. I knew in my heart of hearts. There was no reason. Like my game had been a nervous wreck and she's so confident. So then she says, let's go. We'll go out to dinner one night and we get sushi. It was a horrible date. I was like sitting there going, this is a terrible date. I know on a bad day, it's a bad day. And I'm like, this is going bad. So I was like, okay, this ain't going anywhere. And I, I kind of just let go and I settled into this idea that's not going anywhere as we were leaving the restaurant. And we walked outside and she's standing there waiting to kiss me and she starts leaning in and talking to me like she's gonna kiss me. And I'm like, wait a minute, this was just the worst date ever. And I realized looking in her eyes at that moment, uh, and I believe this without a doubt even today with all my training, that, that they had designed her, like a system relation, they had signed her to do this with me. And I got really pissed. In that moment, I was like, what are you doing? You're lying to me, right? Like, this is bullshit. You yeah. don't, you don't give a, f you don't, you know, this is all, this, I'm a project. I could see she wanted to kiss me from this place of like, this project is what I felt like. Yeah, but at least you're feeling that. And right? yeah, well, then I just told her you're too, I literally looked in her eyes and said, you're just too much. And I turned and walked away and left her there. We were right by the house, so it didn't matter. At least that was a little bit of a reclaim of my power, I felt like. Yeah. 
and that's what so that's what happened there and it was crazy and it was wild that place was a lot of crazy stuff happened there maybe we'll go into more stories about that place someday um hypnotica writes about the same place in his book uh my cock don't talk politics really? eric von Seidel. Yeah. yeah he lived in there too a different uh, a san diego version of the same place yeah. crazy but uh okay so my rock bottom I was living there. I found an ebook on dating. Didn't know such a thing existed on their computer. Read a little bit of it. It was called, uh, it was a Derek Vitalio ebook, a little bit about NLP. Mm. Didn't do much for me, right? But it was kind of interesting. Then I found David D'Angelo because of it. I started searching. So then this guy Daniel's living there and he's getting all the women. And I'm really resentful of him and I'm pissed off. But I could either hate him or I could learn from him. So I decided to learn from him. So I got an apartment with this guy, you know, he doesn't have any money, he's fresh out of jail, he's on parole, but you know what? He's got, he, he, he's working, he's hustling, he's going for it. He's trying to figure out how to make money. And I figure, well, you know what, I'll take the risk. So I move in with him and this girl, and that becomes kind of like my experimental place. And we're going out and we're flirting with girls and I'm pushing my boundaries because at this point, it's not my rock bottom, but I want to push myself. I'm unwilling to take seminars, I'm unwilling to look up mentors, but I'm willing to push myself a little bit, you know? I got Daniel, I watched Daniel, you know, be careful still. And uh, I go out and meet this girl and she's, she's I, I'd never experienced anything like it. I'd been in several relationships long term, but this girl, violin player, worked at this little pub uh, down the street. And uh, and when I, when I met her, I thought, oh, she's cute. Within a week, I couldn't stop thinking about her. I, it was like a pure drug addiction. It was not normal. Mm. And people would be like, oh, Emily must be coming over tonight. And they'd be watching me move around. They're like, hey, they say, you're, you're just completely like nuts about her. And I was like, yeah, I was. When I got my heart broken because I basically pushed her away, I was a complete asshole. I took some advice. It just was really bad. And I didn't know what I was doing. I was trying to learn, right? And um, that sent me into a downward spiral that hurt more than any relationship in my entire life. That was my rock bottom. And I was a miserable, heavy, apathetic depressed mess that nobody wanted to be around for like three months maybe even longer and uh i just people would get near me and they they like ah they were repelled by me like in the house because i just wouldn't come out of it and i was in pain all the time and it was pure abandonment issues coming up like deep core abandonment issues because i had never had somebody that i liked that much reject me i had a lot of people reject me and it hurt like a motherfucker this one felt like i was getting my head cut off you know i was about to be killed so now you're in this deep hole mm -hmm. and now a I'm morass in. and finally money doesn't matter anymore i don't care what i have to spend what i have to do what i have to lose my, <laughs> yeah. my credit my my apartment i'm gonna fix this and what was this at what was this in your mind at the time this issue with women <laughs> this insecurity, yeah. this need, this yeah. fear, this, I don't know how, I'm, how to meet them. I don't know how to talk to them. When I do meet them, I screw it all up and it's work and it's hard work. And so I, uh, I enrolled in my first uh, pickup 101 workshop. They're long gone. And I took them specifically because they really didn't teach technique more than they just teach you how to banter and be funny and playful. And, and, uh, and then I took another one two weeks later. And then next thing you know, uh, I was just hustling. I was pushing, pushing, and they asked me to come in and help out at their workshops. And, you know, it just went from there. And I didn't care. I spent, first workshop was like 20 some hundred dollars, 26. Second one was like 24 plus flights and hotel. And then, and I just kept going. And I was like, at that point, I had just for the first time in my life made some decent money because I was broke until that point. And I hadn't just happened to have enough. I was like, take it. You know, if I'm alone, and this is how I looked at it. If I'm old and alone when I'm in my, and, and when I'm old and I can't get a girl at all and I'm just existing and I can't even talk to people and socialize, what's the point of having money even? And so now the students who come to Fearless are here to figure out that thing with women. Yeah. And they don't know that what they're actually doing is changing their lives. They're falling in love with themselves. I mean, it sounds cliche and gay and uh, whatever you want to call it, right? For the guys that are, I mean, that's modern. Is it gay to fall in love with myself? As but a it's man? not. It's not. It's actually a beautiful thing. But it's true, man. You're learning to take yourself on a date. You learn to love yourself. All the women do is bring up all the places inside yourself you don't you don't like yourself, and that and and then you get to face it. And then as you let go more and more and learn to like you, they just start showing up. It's like we're effortless and. And you can do the opposite, don't get me wrong. You can get really good at meeting women without fixing yourself by putting on a fake veneer. 
high functioning eomimicry and uh, they usually either won't stay around or they'll be really uh, unhappy women themselves. They'll be, it'll, it'll never be good. Cause I kind of did that in the beginning. I started getting a lot of girls, but I noticed it was always like, mm. there was never, I was never enjoying them like I should. And I'm like, oh, is this what it's like to be in a relationship? Then why do I ever want to be in a relationship? That sounds like hard work. Yeah, it, yeah. it, it wasn't. And I realized later it was me and the way I was relating not only to them, but the girls I was picking, the way I was relating to them, the way I was seeing them in my mind's eye. As, and as that changed, these sweetheart, beautiful women started showing up in my life that are giving and more loving. And it still blows my mind, the women that show up today, it's just like, wow. Even women I don't date, there's friends, it's like, wow. And I realized how much, how amazing as human beings, men and women can be if we get out of our own way, you know, if we stop beating ourselves up. And, what great human beings we can be. Mm. Um, so how about you? Let's 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 hear Sam's. Uh, wow, my bottom. Did you did you tell it on the podcast? I don't remember. Yeah. I talked about all kinds. You of did. Stuff. You talked about. I remember the bottom with the uh, where you went to this way to the center. I don't want to. That's the bottom. That was my bottom. Yeah. yeah. My bottom was actually was I was so out of touch with what I was feeling. Everything had been so compartmentalized for so long. Um, and just through force of will, I was making, I was making a life happen. That it was my body that said, since you're not paying attention to what's going on, my body said, okay, well, I'm just going to shut you down. I'm just going to shut you down. And so it was a it wasn't really like an awakening. It was like I had to go down. I, I had to get buried before. I remember you said you couldn't time. even see. Couldn't even see. Yeah. See, my first thought when you said that was, it sounds like like the diabetes and blood sugar is off. But no, no, uh, my body was getting so shut down that I the last the last two three days was things were getting so blurry that I, I it, w it wasn't darkness. It was just I couldn't see things. I got I would put out my phone in my wallet and and I touch them. I go okay, that's a phone. That's that's, that's some scary shit, dude. Like you literally, you got to be sitting there thinking, am I, am I going blind? You know, am I going blind? I, I don't know if you would be thinking, that's what I'd be thinking. It's just like, am I going blind? Am I going to be, is this because my eyes going to be like this the rest of their life? You know, that's interesting. I didn't have that thought. I had the thought of something is going on that's much bigger than blindness. That's, I had that thought. And somehow I thought Power to you, man. this could be fixed. See, see my, my challenge with this is if for me, it would have been that I've had so many chronic illnesses in my mm. life that when the next one comes on, I always have this crash if it comes and then I have to come back. Now, they, now I come out of it really fast and I tend to heal really fast, but yeah. that memory of all that pain is there. And I'm like, oh fuck, what is oh, this? Yeah. You know, there's a sense of, oh, what the fuck is this? And I have, I've been releasing and working on that, so. Nice. So go ahead, sorry to interrupt. But. Uh, that was at the airport hotel <laughs> the night before I got on the flight to this place in in Santa Fe. I mean, everything was shutting down. I could, there was just my whole body ached. Uh, yeah, I was going blind. I was having hallucinations. Yeah. I was having major hallucinations. I saw the depths, swirling depths of hell in my front steps of my house. I was looking down going, what the fuck? There's all my sins all of everything I hated about myself was swirling down into the darkness. And I swear I saw that. So you think all of this, these visions and the blindness and all this, or not blindness, but the bad vision and the, and the images you were seeing, the swirling depths of hell, <laughs> was all because of your guilt or shame or, or what, what was that? Yeah, um, guilt, shame, um, anger, sadness it was all i had not i didn't have i didn't have a relationship with any of that stuff mm -hmm. i was functioning in a with that what i mentioned over the weekend it was a positive reality it was a sheen of positive reality but everything else was churning it below and when i got to the um, to that recovery center whatever it was they said you know you um you have childhood trauma so this positive reality idea is this idea that in a functional person they see the world fun uh, basically positive and things work for them on average. They want to start a business that basically works. Maybe they have some challenges, but they make it work. Um, learned helplessness, learned helplessness or a negative reality is the opposite of that. What he was talking about is he had this fake positive reality where a nice guy send well, not even nice guy, like, like those people that pretend to be positive all the time. Everything yeah. is great. Sunny Jim. <laughs> I'm happy, yeah. you know, and they're completely insane underneath. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's what it, so did I describe that right? That's pretty, <laughs> that's pretty right. Yeah. So then I, um, uh, yeah, I just went, uh, I just went spinning down and then it basically couldn't, I couldn't contain it anymore. I couldn't keep the containers separate. And so everything went crashing together. That was a low bottom. I mean, I was drinking a lot at the time too. And that was like, that was the only way I was keeping everything sort of glued, uh, together. And that was just the numbing mechanism, totally the distraction numbing. mechanism. Yeah. yeah. And so from that center, they got you off the alcohol. And then yeah, and then they so I said, you know, you had, and it, that childhood abuse thing was really interesting because I thought I was the survivor in my crazy household. My sisters had a lot of struggles, but I was the one who was getting the A's, who was traveling, who had careers, and I was just- Perfect on paper. The perfect, yeah, it looked really good on paper. <laughs> I thought I was had risen, floated all above, but I hadn't dealt with any of the shit. Yeah. So how long did it take? How long ago was that? That was nine years ago. And then, so you've done a lot of work in nine years, sir. Yeah. Good job. Yeah, and when I came out, it was like that. Um, it, and there was everybody from, at that recovery center, there was every problem that could be arise from, you know, uh, early childhood trauma. And when I came out, it was like, I was just like, I was like raw. I was like raw. It was like being, I was birthed. I was so sensitive. I was so confused. And I went back to a marriage that wasn't working and they said, okay, time to claw my way ah. <laughs> somewhere, <laughs> claw my way somewhere. This reminds me, cause this, this is the story I was telling when I climbed out of being so sick from with, with the torn gut and I was, I had the blood in my uh, throat from the, from the thrush and everything. And, yeah. and I detoxed for that for like a year I was emotionally and physically detoxing and it was just it's days out I was talking about the I remember this one day but many days I'd get up pure pure anxiety and I'd be crying sometimes and I walk my way to the shower and start my day anyways mm -hmm. I did not stay in that fucking bed and because I knew what that meant and I knew I had to step into tension to cause a catalyst of change you know like you hit that first domino and if you just lay in bed there's no domino being hit that day so I get on the, in that shower, I cry in the shower, I get out, yeah. I do my shit and I get going. I knew little choices. Yeah, and it would eventually have to cause an opening somewhere. And So uh, you had some faith? At the core level, yes, because I would release all day long too. And I, if I didn't have faith, I'd release till I felt calm again at yeah. some point. But on some days I didn't have time, I had to go do something. And so I just walked right through it. And I remember my, my hands, during that period had gotten so from the, the the overgrowth of candida and everything it was just like they felt like they had arthritis they were crunching up and uh it was really painful i'd wake up and i was always worried i was going to have that the rest of my life now they're fine you know with all the cleansing and all the work i've done it's, it's amazing how much better i feel do you remember that uh, it was in the early chapters of uh of letting go where he has four pages of the list of all the things people try to change their lives yeah everything from I, I can't the list is too vast and the first time i read that book i went yep did that tried that tried that yep no but i thought about it <laughs> i was about 70 percent on that list yeah. i was just trying everything yeah and, and the key the key here and this is the big key because i tried tons of stuff too and it's not the stuff on that list doesn't work because it does work for people that wouldn't be on the list it just doesn't work for everybody yeah and everybody that's down in apathy really low on the emotional scale apathy grief fear a little pain they're stuck this stuff is only going to do so much for unless the, the, the unless the practitioner really is talented beyond the technique oh, yeah. uh, and because it's not the technique that's doing anything the techniques they're all playing with the same energy so what you're working with is depth of feeling in your body if you don't have a sense like we, we look at on our videos when we do work how low somebody is in their body if they're way up in their head they're locked out safe door lock combination lock and I could do that technique all day long. It ain't gonna do shit because they ain't emotionally available. They can't feel. You can't change an emotion if you can't feel. So the first step, when I met Carl, that was the first thing. You would need to learn to feel you're not in your body. And it was like, get down in here and learn to feel all these parts I had disassociated from. I was living up here and I was like, hey, how you doing, man? What's your, you know, or I, I don't even think I could mimic how I looked back then, but it was like, hey, you know, and talking from pushing, hey, how you doing? Everything was controlled from up here. Like I right. felt a little hiding on that one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then in time, he taught me to come back down. Um, well, I did Landmark for a solid year. I, and, you know, it was powerful. I learned a couple of things that really shifted me. But it was just like pounding. It's like, yeah. do this, do this, take this action. And it's so action-oriented. And it's, at the end, I went, what the hell? 
what, what did I just do? This is another thing is, is uh, we talked about the action. You got to have action, but you got to have the right amount of action, not too much, not too little. Mm -hmm. You lift too much weight, you hurt yourself. You lift too little weight, nothing happens. Then you've got to also be in feeling with the thing you're doing. Yeah. Um, if you really want fast results, these are the keys. Be in feeling with it, be consistent with it, you know. Um, but you also got to do the internal work. You got to stop. Like I take some action, but then I also got to stop and learn to love myself. Take some action, stop and learn to love myself. If I just take action all the time and I don't stop and learn to love myself, I'm heading for a, a bounce back that could be super nasty. But if I take, if I keep stopping along the way every morning and do a morning practice where I practice loving the moment just the way it is, I don't need to change a damn thing. I don't need to change my life. It's yeah. perfect the way it is. Yeah. You know, and then I build off of a beautiful foundation, then I'll move forward beautifully. But if you try to, sh you, I, I'm going to get here because I hate here. This is going to bounce back someday. Or you're just going to numb out so much that you're going to be so miserable when you get here. Something's going to happen. I wouldn't put down landmark at all. I think it's powerful, wise, filled with a lot of wisdom um, and probably helpful for a lot of people. But I found that I was in so much action and I actually had written an entire play and produced it as one of the challenges. I got a ton done. And at the end of it, I went, I felt, okay, I did that. I feel tired. And how come I don't feel a deep internal shift? I know I got all that stuff done, but I didn't have any momentum. And that's because that's you weren't working on that one piece, the, the piece. All, that's, all the doing just helps to change your being. That's the purpose of the doing. It's to help to bring up the stories that are in your being. So yeah. you do all this doing to build this play. You feel all this resistance. And my one complaint about a lot of teachers, they just teach you to ignore it and eventually it'll shift. <laughs> right. And you welcome it and you learn to let it go and let it go and you open wider and wider and breathe it in deeper. And like David Data says, you breathe it into you and you feel it fully, you know? And then once felt fully, you can let it go and then there's no more resistance to it. Then the next, if you really truly did, let's say you could do that perfectly, which it's not a perfect world, so you're not gonna do it perfectly. If you did it perfectly with the whole process creating the play, the next play you create will be easier. Much is so fluid. And I'll know what to do with it. It will it will flow someplace. Yeah, exactly. This conversation also, I, one of the things I jumped into, I'd been practicing yoga for a long time, but I started really upping the program to try to really understand it. I didn't do teacher training, but I was really involved. And I was, it was only about three years ago when I realized my practice wasn't deepening. Yeah. because I was actually not feeling the practice and I was competing with myself and I was competing with everybody else around me and I was looking for the validation from the teacher. So it was, I was doing everything right but everything was hard and I wasn't growing. So you're trying to do the perfect postures, the perfect positions, the perfect, what were you? Oh well, yeah, and then say, hmm, I could do, uh, I could do crow up this far up my elbows last week but I, I haven't gotten up past that pint so I just have to work harder. So yeah, so I gotta put more effort in. It's all about the stretch and the position and how you look, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and the effort, and this effort, like I got a muscle to get up to this. And you were living in Hollywood at this time? <laughs> <laughs> Hollywood yoga. <laughs> Hollywood yoga. No, deep in the San Francisco yoga scene. Now, it wasn't until I surrendered. It was a huge learning moment where I, the teachers kept saying, take it, oh, they'd always say, take it up to your limit. And I'm, part of my brain is saying, fuck you, I, I can do better than my limit. <laughs> and, and I wasn't getting it. And finally, well, I remember one class I said, wow, what if I just stop trying? And all of a sudden, I went from this crazy crow to plank, snap back, which I'd always tumbled to the ground before. And I said, what if I stopped, didn't try to do this? Didn't use my muscles for it. Yeah, the energy was supporting you. Did you feel the energy flow through your body? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I remember the first time that happened to me. And then I thought, there's a clue. This is a, this is, this is a message for me for a lot of things. Yeah. Could have been a message for me the last three days, too. <laughs> That's all a message, man. I don't think anything's by chance, but uh, I was in a yoga class once and the same thing happened to me long with that, that yoga cult community that I was in. Um, <laughs> I was sitting there and, and I was doing a yoga pose and I, and I was feeling into the stretch. And then I said, what if I went, what do I feel? I felt like something in the muscle. I said, what is that? And I felt into it and I, it was almost like this shut off for a second. I just felt this flow through my leg and body and it was 
this energy like they felt like that yeah and i was felt like and then i immediately was like what the fuck is that and i was like whoa and i was like that's a trip and then i said what if that's what yoga is really about and then i found out later that's feeling that's being in feeling you know as as my old teacher carl would say that was what yoga was all about and then i started looking around i said how many of these yogis even know what yoga is about well that makes me think that feeling it has power because I wasn't using my muscles anymore. I was using more feeling and flow and having more strength than I had before. Like water through a fire hose. Yeah, you turn the water on, it flows, and then the higher fire hose becomes strong. It becomes strong, yeah. yeah. That's what it felt like, yeah. Yeah, and that's that's exactly it. And you've, you've done that exercise, right, with the arm, with the muscle and the, yeah. and the fire hose. Yeah. Yeah. It's basically, an, it, <laughs> it's a simple exercise. And everybody's done it, I think. But you hold the arm out and you imagine it's really strong and pull it down and, and then tell them to hold the arm out and imagine it's a fire hose and there's just water flowing through it and then, then try to pull it down. You'll see it, how much stronger it is with way less effort. Right. And that that illustrates this, this the idea of this point. I think this conversation is really funny because we started talking about bottoms and now we the, the train's gone off the tracks and it's yeah. found its own tracks. <laughs> but it's a fun conversation to have. That's it. And that's the point of these podcasts is, yeah. uh, and these, these interviews is we're going to sit down and have these discussions and see where we go a little bit and you know we were talking about bottoms but that's if we spend some time talking about bottoms we are just going back in time to our old stories and we were talking we were just we just launched from there and we just started talking about opportunities so yeah and that's well that's really it that's the difference there was a time my teacher would say brian you can't do anything but talk about the past which was all my problems yeah. And he, he would tell me to shut up until I could talk about something else. He could be brutal sometimes, right? Was, Brian, shut up till you can say something else. And I remember weeks went on and I didn't talk for a few weeks in class. And because I got tired of him telling, because every time I'd speak, he'd say, Brian, shut up, you're speaking from the past. Brian, shut up, you're speaking from the past. And about three or four weeks uh, into this, uh, he, I, I, mean, I just stopped talking. I'm sitting there, but I want to be there because I know he knows what he's doing. He's got it down. I know he can, we can do, I'm learning from this guy. And uh, so I'm sitting there and he goes, Brian, if you don't speak, I'm gonna kick you out of class. And uh, so now I'm like, shit, I gotta share again now. Ah, and this, so I start to speak, ah, Brian, you're in your head. I think it was in your head. He's speaking from your pastor in your head. And Brian, you're in your head. And he's like, he's like, he's like, don't speak unless you're, you know, and I was back to the same thing again. Eventually I figured it out. It, it was, it was rough, but you know, he trapped me to a point where I had nothing left to do but feel. And there was this day I turned beet red and I wanted to kill him because he pushed me into the corner so much. And I was like, Arr! and he, he saw my face turn red. He saw this blood rush through me. He saw this anger. And then he said, uh, look, Brian's feeling. And everybody turned and went, look, Brian's feeling. And they all started smiling because for the first time it wasn't in my head, I was having a real emotion. So all those stories were just taking you into numb numbness i was analytically speaking you know, i was like students speak super analytical yeah that's all i was doing was speaking super analytical that's why i always say the teacher doesn't always tell you what you want to hear he tells you what you need to hear you know and that's not always comfortable and he'll do things you may not understand sometimes and that's really a tough judgment call because yeah. is he doing something he doesn't understand because he's uh, he's doing something wrong and, or he you don't he's a bad person because teachers can take advantage or is he doing something you don't understand because these guys are best growth in mind and he knows you need this and you need to surrender. And and a lot of times, um, you know, when I look at it, I just say, is this gonna, is this gonna, you know, is this illegal? Is it gonna hurt anybody physically? No, well, maybe I should try it on for a little bit mm-hmm. and get an experience of it. Uh, you know, I can still be wary of what I'm doing and expand and cautiously, but I can, but if it's not dangerous, why even just step in, you know? See what it feels like to try it on. Well, that goes into the whole question of, as a coach, you wonder, I'm, I'm getting past this now, is, is this the right thing to say, the wrong thing to say? Am I seeing what's right or what I'm seeing is not right? And once you start dropping into, there is no right and there is no wrong, it's just what you're seeing and what your impulse is in the moment. It may not work the way you think it was going to work, but something is going to happen. As long as your intention is not to hurt the guy, then, and letting go of like, that moment of you know squeezing someone too tight or is that how do you know I, th- this is you know as i've only been coaching for about a year or two it's like if i say this or do this in this moment how do i know this is the right i don't know if i'm right how often is your intuition right i mean not not just like this random thought but this 
overwhelming feeling that comes from low in your body, right? Yeah, you know right. what I'm talking about? Yeah. It literally does come from your gut, gut brain, right? Look up gut as a second brain on, on Google. Yeah. And you feel, you're getting used to feeling that. Yeah. And you see how much, especially when we do the video feedback work, you start to see how much you're, you get these hits one after another. It's such good gut at training. My clue to speak up is when the voice in my head says, should I say this? And the should I is actually that gut saying, by having a little battle with my ego. Yeah. And so as soon as I hear myself, should I kiss the girl? Should I do this? Should I? It's probably time to do that. And there's your tension right there. Yeah. Yeah, that's going to grow you. That's going to be the conduit. Uh, it's going to open a conduit to a new place of being. Um, and by the way, when we talk about uh, video feedback, in, in a lot of our workshops, we actually videotape people and do feedback. But we don't do feedback in the sense of, here's model, or, or we'll have you with women, but we won't be doing role play. We're actually looking at your, at your at deep, super subconscious patterns and how you're playing them out. And it's really hard to explain until you see it. It allows us to, uh, to show you how you're presenting yourself to the world and, and how you're seeing. We just did it to ourselves for the last three days. All the yeah, coaches yeah. were in a private workshop. And I make them go through it, constantly improve their skills. What was, do you want to share a little bit about your experience? It's the first time you've done it. It's the first time he's been in one because he's yeah, the newer, the newest one. coach. Yeah, yeah, it was really challenging. I'm just actually having like, whoa, what the, what happened the last three days? So it, what we were talking about before was that sense of watching myself on video doing something that only happened 10 minutes before. And there's a difference between that man 10 minutes before and the man watching it and learning how to watch myself without judging myself and accepting like, oh, there's a guy 10 minutes ago and there's a picture of him on the screen. And he's feeling something and now, but he's feeling something different than I'm feeling right now watching him. And the releases that come from, it really hit me how deep the shifts are when I watch myself, once I drop those resistances, which are usually judgments like, yeah. ooh, I don't want to look at that angle. Oh, do you, have you figured this shit out yet, Sam? You know, you're all literally stuff. dropping all these judgments you have towards yourself. Yeah. And on top of that, how much just somebody standing there and not really even talking, how much subcommunication can you see going on? Like no. pushing away, pulling back, pulling inside, say, all these little things they're doing just with little tiny micro expressions. Yeah. And so we were talking about the work, actually doing the work with the model has, is, is powerful, but it's, there's a lot for, for me, there was a lot of tension for, for most of the weekend. So I was watching a man dealing with tension and trying to discover something about tension. But then watching myself, I felt like, ah, oh, look at that guy. He's, he's doing his best. He's got a lot of tension. I see the tension there. And then I start to relax watching myself going through it. And I realize, oh, this is the other half of the work. Love, compassion, feeling more flow. Yeah. You pointed out that, wow, the guy sitting there watching that guy is really different than the guy who's on the screen right now. And it often is the case when you used to, and it goes two ways. Sometimes the guy watching is, it looks worse than the guy on the screen. <laughs> that was true for me the first time. Too. So I had one client years ago and he, he, I pulled out the video work and he took off his glasses and set them down. And I said, so, aren't you gonna wear your glasses? And he's like, no, I can't, I can't wear the glasses yet. I said, I need to work up to that. It, it needs to be blurry <laughs> for a little bit. I, said, I can't stand seeing myself. And uh, he did, he worked his way up slowly and shifted because Think about it. if you pull out pictures of yourself or video of yourself, how do you feel when you see yourself? That represents your internal self image, how you feel about yourself. And as you learn to look at that stuff, and even when you're screwing shit up and doing it wrong, which you will, you could be the best at this stuff ever, and you'll still see stuff on the video. But when you can look at that guy and say, he's pretty cool anyways, I like him anyways, I yeah, love him. Anyways. He's showing up. He's showing up. Yeah. That's then you'll start showing up in life even when you're not. And that's what that's what makes it work. Women don't need you to be perfect. They just want you to show up. It's really pretty simple in yeah. the end. In the end, it's so simple, it's ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah, and there's still a part of my mind that says, no, this, there's gotta be some work to do. Yeah. And then once you drop into that, oh, wait a minute, what if I'm just where I am right now and still show up and still say hello or still make a pass or still try something new in the bedroom, yeah. which all brings up tension. It's, it's hard work until it's easy. And then once it's easy, you wonder why it was hard. Yeah. And that's what it comes down to. So uh, with that said, I want to uh, thank you guys. I mean, this was awesome. This is, we haven't, I consider this the first of many 
with Mr. Pond and many other people and myself and uh, rambling conversation with Sam and Brian. That's right. Ram <laughs> rambles, you know, the podcast rambles. Uh, we'll, we'll work on getting different guests in here too and doing different podcasts, different events, and uh, we'll, we'll develop this out. And if you like it, please let us know. Remember to comment below if you haven't commented. Remember to like and subscribe. Uh, make sure to hit that bell notification to get more videos because we have lots of awesome content coming and more down the pike, more interviews, more conversations, all that great stuff. If you want to follow us on Instagram, make sure to go to uh, The Fearless Man. It's easy to find on Instagram. Or you can go to my channel if you want to check it out. It's just got some random pictures of me doing stuff around the world. And that's uh, Brian Begin, or Brian Bajan is how you pronounce it, but Brian, B-R-I-A-N, B-E-G-I-N. So with that said, remember, only the confident really live. Take care.